Chapter 1. Success begins with you. All real leaders exceed their job descriptions. Are you the problem or the solution? No matter what you say and no matter what you do, success ultimately begins with you. In order for me to begin my journey and for you to begin your own, understanding this principle is the starting point for developing excellent team members. The good news is, once you understand this, you'll be in control of your destiny. A number of years ago, on my birthday, which is October 6th, I was reading the horoscope in the New York Post. This has been my personal ritual for more than 30 years. This time it was different. My life had taken an incredible turn when my wife of 10 years, Jackie Klein Goodman, passed away after battling cancer. I had to make some life decisions, some easy and some more difficult. My 50th birthday horoscope was a life-changing and profound statement. I actually had it framed and hung it in my bathroom. I look at it every day as a reminder of who really is in control of our destiny. If you want more freedom, then it's up to you to take it. No one is going to hand it to you on the plate. What is it that you want to do with your life? Then get on and do it. The only permission you need is your own. New York Post, October 6, 2013. This spoke to me in many ways, especially when it was time to decide what was really important about being a leader, making my mark on the planet, and leaving a positive leadership and life legacy. I decided to look at things a little bit differently. I heard about a goal-setting technique that many leaders used. The idea behind it was writing your own obituary. Think about what you want people to say about you after you have left the planet. This seemed like a perfectly good idea to apply to leadership and what you want people to say about you as a leader after your professional business career is finished. I call this the leadership epitaph. Your leadership epitaph. Try imagining this scenario. You've been a boss for more than 20 years, managing many employees in different positions throughout your career. You walk into a busy restaurant and suddenly look over and see one of your former employees. A few minutes later, when you turn around, that person is whispering to friends. You imagine they're talking about you. At this time, you're thinking about their conversation. The former employee gestures toward you. You see that person over there? That used to be my boss. Oh, really? A good boss or a bad boss? Now, here are my questions for you. What do you want your former employees to say in response to this question? What will your current employees be saying about you years or decades down the line? Will they remember you at all? And if they pass you on the street, will their immediate recollections of you be fond and admiring or negative? This is your starting point for leadership self-evaluation. What really do you want? To be an excellent leader or to be a boss? We will discuss the difference later. The leadership epitaph is the need for leaders to think about how they'll be remembered and what that might mean for the way they lead their team right now, which contributes to their legacy in the future. There are a couple of different dimensions to the leadership epitaph. There is the broader sense of what your tenure as a leader will ultimately mean to the company. Will you be remembered as the executive who created new jobs, expanded profits, and helped the company soar to new heights? Or will you be remembered as the person who was in charge during a period of major layoffs and losses? Frankly, I think most employees will remember you less for the big picture stuff and more for the day-to-day. -day. Do you lead by inspiring your employees or yelling at them? Are you open to their feedback? Do you make them feel valued? Do you allow them to have their voices heard? Do you empower your employees to be productive and happy in their work life? These are the things your employees will remember. These are the things that will one day compromise your leadership epitaph. These are the things that I began to work on immediately in order to build my team and reach all of our goals. I encourage you to do the same. When I began my study of successful leaders, the one common denominator that I noticed was that all real leaders go beyond their job descriptions. All real leaders exceed their job descriptions. This brings me to an individual I admire because he brings out the best in everyone around him while remaining focused on his vision. He is truly a solutions-oriented leader who has not only exceeded his job description, he has also written a job description through his deeds and career for all to admire. Because of this, his leadership epitaph has already been written and it continues to grow daily. Dr. Nito Cobain is an American, Lebanese, Jordanian businessman, motivational speaker, and has been president of High Point University in North Carolina since 2005. Dr. Cobain's background is impressive. However, his hard work and dedication to leading and developing solutions is what sets him apart from many in his field. What makes him special is he has never forgotten his roots and always gives back more than is received. 
After graduating from High Point University in 1970, he went on to the University of North Carolina in Greensboro to earn his Master of Science in Business Education degree and returned in 2009 as he was awarded an Honorary Doctor of Letters and Humanity. More importantly, a leader leaves an epitaph by taking action and developing solutions to problems that can stand the test of time. In 2005, High Point University was only 92 acres and landlocked to the total undergraduate enrollment of 1,450 students. The university's operating budget was only $38 million with approximately 100 faculty members. In 2017, High Point University undergraduate enrollment reached 5,000 students, a 245% growth, had a 203% increase in full-time faculty. The buildings on campus went from 22 to 112, with an over 409% growth. The operating and capital budget increased to $290 million, a 663% increase. With the creation of new schools, majors, and courses, Dr. Cobain created a remarkable variety of learning opportunities for the students to embark on a new world and also become solution-oriented leaders. High Point University's rankings soared from number 17 in 2005 to number 1. The university was named the number one regional college in the South for 2019 for the seventh consecutive year in America's Best Colleges by U.S. News & World Report. High Point was also recognized in America's Best Colleges as the number one most innovative regional college in the South for making the most innovative improvements in terms of curriculum, faculty, students, campus life, technology, or facilities. When we talk about what it takes to be a solutions-oriented leader, who wants to make a difference in the world and leave a leadership epitaph to be proud of, Dr. Nito Cobain is an excellent example to model. In the workplace, we tend to define ourselves according to job titles and descriptions. Our title establishes what we do and what we're in charge of, what our responsibilities are, and what's outside our obligation. Our job title defines what we need to do and what's frankly not our concern. It lets us know when we are fulfilling our obligations and, perhaps, when we are truly going the extra mile. As I have studied successful leaders over the past 30 years, one of the common denominators is that they all exceed their job descriptions. In fact, many of them create their own job descriptions by going the extra mile in doing whatever it takes to get the job done and complete the goals and objectives of the organization. So what would happen if you didn't have a job description? What if you arrived at work one day and there was no longer any hierarchy? No way in which the members of your team were categorized. Would it be disastrous? Would it mean that work would grind to a standstill? Or would people step up to do whatever it took for their team to succeed, regardless of whether it was truly their responsibility or not? I'm not saying this is how things should be. Job titles and hierarchies serve useful functions in coordinating the office and facilitating delegation and project management. However, your response to this hypothetical scenario may be telling. It may speak volumes about your propensity for real leadership. Real leadership means understanding your job description and the job descriptions of everyone on your team, but it also means not being bound by those descriptions. Leadership isn't about doing only what is part of your job description. It's about doing anything and everything you can do to elevate your team members to a place where they can succeed and about ensuring that everyone is working together toward meeting the team's goals. Real leaders know that job descriptions can be helpful, but they don't tell the full story of your team members and their unique talents. You may have someone whose job title technically involves sales and customer service, but what if that person also happens to be an extraordinarily gifted writer? Allowing that team member to write some company blog posts will be a boon to the entire team and it will also help the team member feel respected, affirmed, and appreciated. It's a win for all, but to tap into that potential, you have to know your team members beyond just their job titles. And by the way, you also need to know your own strengths and weaknesses beyond whatever your job description entails. Leaders who are willing to earnestly assess and appraise themselves and to know where to be hands-on and where to delegate, separate themselves from the rest of the pack and quickly develop followers. This may mean coloring outside the lines of your official formal job description. And if it does, then so be it. Leadership means understanding your team, its members, and its goals, including but not limited to the titles that people hold. One technique I use to determine what my employees are doing is to have them write down their own job descriptions. This has allowed me to discover if my employees were on the right path in fulfilling their goals and objectives. It also gave me the opportunity to expand the parameters of their job, to focus on the highest and best use of their talents to reach their potential in addition to reaching the company's goals. 
If you were like me, when you were in school, there were many leadership courses offered. In fact, it might have even been your belief that the best leaders were the loudest individuals in class. I've also met many people who thought that people had to be extroverts to be effective leaders. When I started on my journey studying leadership success, I found a great discrepancy with my belief system. It was based on many false references within our culture. The fact of the matter is, though, from my experience and research, introverts make great leaders. How Introverts Make Great Leaders Unfortunately, it's been my experience that we live in a culture that closely links extroversion with leadership. Now, I'm a bit of an extrovert myself, but nevertheless, I have to say as an international keynote speaker and leadership coach that some of the best, most effective leaders I have seen have been introverts by nature. When we assume that brashness and loudness go hand in hand with decisiveness, we do so at our own peril. One of the main things that holds introverts back, I think, is the perception that those who are quiet, even shy, cannot make commanding figures. That misconception keeps many introverts from reaching their true leadership potential, but it doesn't have to. Consider the following four tips that you can use if you are an introvert to break through those perceptions and turn your introversion into an asset, not a liability. Number one, remember that listening, not talking, is the mark of a really engaging leader. The best leaders aren't necessarily the ones who talk the most. Often they're the ones who actively listen, truly engaging with the team members, colleagues, and customers before offering solutions. Introverts tend to be well poised with their active listening skills. Number two, remain calm during times of crisis. When things get rocky, brash, and loquacious, leaders can often fly off the handle, but introverts can be the voice of reason. Use that to your advantage. Seize crisis as opportunities to provide stable, steady leadership. Number three, force yourself out of your comfort zone. You may not have much interest in making small talk or delivering big speeches, and to an extent that's fine, but there's a case to be made for playing to your strengths. Sometimes you have to push yourself a bit. That's the only way you'll ever grow as a leader. Number four, allow yourself some quiet time. Introverts need a little space to breathe, to recharge their batteries, and that's fine. Take 15 minutes each morning to be alone, to be quiet, and to give yourself some space before you tackle the challenges of the day. By following these four tips, I believe that any leader, even an introvert, can break down the misconceptions and show real leadership skills. There is also another factor that leaders need to consider when starting on their journey towards success. I'm talking about the way we handle situations and perceptions based on our past experiences. How we respond or how we react has a direct relation to our emotional intelligence or EQ. Why your EQ matters as a leader. Do you think a high IQ is a guarantee of business success? Think again. Today's leaders know that brains alone aren't enough to build a team or establish it for success. Emotional engagement is just as important. This is where the concept of emotional intelligence, or EQ, comes into play in your success as a leader. Maybe you're familiar with EQ. Basically, it refers to your ability to perceive and identify emotions in the workplace and in your relationships with others. It means being attuned to the emotions of the people around you, but also to your own emotions, and making your decisions accordingly. Many leaders I have worked with over the years have been highly skillful and intelligent, yet they couldn't control their emotions. Consequently, they had great difficulty getting others on board to back the missions and goals of the leader. Emotional intelligence is a good predictor of your success in fostering relationships and forging strong teams. It's a concept worth learning about and an aptitude that's worth developing. Let me share with you what my studies have revealed. EQ can help you cultivate employee engagement and retention. Today's employees don't merely want good salaries and benefits. They want a sense of belonging. They want a sense of social contact. If you can respond to the emotional cues of your employees and provide them with that sense that they are valued members of a true team, that can help you in both recruitment and retention. Leaders with high EQ better understand how their employees derive satisfaction. Different people define failure and success in different ways and have different factors that motivate their workplace performance. Having EQ will help you identify these specific drivers for each employee and build a workplace dynamic that provides everyone with necessary motivators. EQ can assist in team building too. How do you get your people to collaborate? How do you structure a team that allows everyone to play to their unique strengths? EQ helps you to answer these questions and to build a team that works cohesively. Finally, 
EQ can help identify your employees' management styles. How should you handle one employee compared to another, and which manager would make the best mentor for a given team member? These are the kinds of preferential questions that high EQ can help you answer. As a leadership speaker, I meet countless executives and managers who are looking for the secret sauce, the competitive edge to take their team building prowess to the next level. I'm telling you here that EQ is a big part of that sauce. The good news is that there are many ways you can improve your emotional intelligence. The keys are accountability, self-assessment, a desire to improve, and the ability to recognize what you need to take responsibility and inspire others. Once you do that, you will know that you are inspiring your team by paying attention to the seven traits of inspiring leaders. Seven Traits of Inspiring Leaders My first book, Living a Championship Life, A Game Plan for Success, contained a quote of mine that I live by. Located on the first page, it reads, Leaders motivate and inspire. They relentlessly create the vision and set strategies for action. Their ultimate gift is not to have followers, but to develop many other leaders. Of course, you may be asking yourself, am I a great leader? Do I have the hallmarks of what it takes to be truly inspirational? A self-inventory is necessary to know for sure. However, to help you gauge your own leadership capacity, there is one thing I have noticed on my journey to success when studying some of the greatest leaders in business and in sports. There are specific signs or traits that you can look for to determine if you're inspiring your team or just hoping for the best. I have identified seven traits of inspiring leaders during my personal journey to improve my own leadership skills, to retain my employees, and achieve the maximum productivity and happiness quotient we can have in our business. The list of seven traits follow. Number one, perfecting a sense of purpose beyond your own success. Wanting to achieve great things on your own terms hardly makes you a leader. No. Leaders are folks who measure their own success by the success of others. They see it as their mission and purpose to help their team members thrive. If your purpose is to empower, you may be an inspiring leader. Number two, approachable. Do your team members feel comfortable approaching you with questions, concerns, or feedback? Or do they tremble at the very thought of entering your office? If you're intimidating rather than approachable, that's a problem. Number three, open-minded. Great leaders are open to whatever works, even if it's not their own idea. Do you actively court solutions and suggestions from your team members and implement the ones you think will work? Inspiring leaders do. Number four, candid and constructive. Inspiring leaders give the gift of feedback. If your team members actually accept your constructive feedback and make changes to their performance, that shows their respect for you and that you're trying to help them improve. Number five, treating your employees with equality. Favoritism and inspiration do not work together. If your employees feel like you prefer some of them over others, that ultimately reflects badly on your leadership style. Number six, being grateful. Inspiring leaders are thankful for the efforts of their team, and they're not afraid to say so. Number seven, focus on your team. If you're happy to give credit to team members rather than hog it all for yourself, then you definitely have some inspiring leadership traits. Take stock of yourself and use these points to determine how inspiring a leader you are already. You may even surprise yourself. Remember one thing. Teams go where you go. Your team will always take on the attitude and traits of its leader. My good friend, branding expert and frequent Fox TV business personality, Bruce Turkel, wrote a book titled All About Them. Grow your business by focusing on others. If we are to lead people, we have to focus on people first in order to be truly inspiring. I have a saying, if you give to get, you're even. If you give expecting nothing in return, you're ahead of the game. Success begins with you. So if you want to succeed as a solutions-oriented leader and turn your team into future leaders, focus on how you can support your team to achieve their goals and you'll achieve yours at the same time. The Solutions-Oriented Leader Written by Rick Goodman Narrated by Rick Goodman Published by Sound Wisdom